Chapter 21, Freeland, Part 2. In the morning, all the citizens of Freeland gathered in the meadow to sing to the rising sun. Johnny was awakened by the sound, soft and reverberant, through the walls. He got up and put on the orange robe. His mind was clear and curious. His legs wanted to be moving, his hands to be doing. The sky above the meadow arched brilliant blue, the meadow grass green, turning to gold, glistening with dewdrops. The breeze carried the scent of bay laurel and alder berries. The old oaks were sprouting their young leaves like new spring dresses. The orange-robed singers moved with a loosely knit precision, weaving in and out strands forming and dissolving, forming again. Some held hands, others moved the dough. Johnny felt at home in his robe, entering the meadow and the flow of moving bodies. There were plenty of other bearded men his age. There were old men and women, young girls, children. Some were fat, some were thin, some tall, some short. There were all shades of skin from night sky black to peony pink. No one's energy was stronger than anyone else's. There was relaxation and a sense of active peace. He joined the singing. The melodies were simple and there were no words, just open vocalizations. If he met someone's eyes, they merely smiled in recognition and only turned away when the flow pulled them on. At some point, the singing stopped and everyone sat on the ground. A formation of orange-robed people moved through the crowd, handing out cups and some kind of round loaf. Bow Wow was among them. When he saw Johnny, he knelt beside him, poured something from a pitcher into a cup and handed it to him. It was warm and spicy. Did you sleep well, young sojourner? I slept wonderfully well. I am comfortable here. Bow Wow smiled. Don't become so comfortable that you cannot leave at a moment's notice. He tore off a large piece of the loaf and handed it to Johnny. Come, I will show you the garden. A footbridge across a tree-lined creek led to another sunlit clearing. A round building made of what appeared to be dried mud stood before a forested background. Its graceful curves and lines suggested it had been fashioned lovingly by a single hand, although its highest spires were as tall as the tops of the trees. The garden poured from its doors. Purple grapes hung from the arbor over a path through cultivated rows. Beans climbing poles, corn already tasseling so early. Yellow blossoms emerging from the open hands of squash plants. Tender green raspberries dancing on a fence. Here and there, orange-robed people were working, hoeing new rows, trimming vines, raking mulch over fresh-turned earth, where inquisitive blackbirds hopped about, watching for worms. Some people stood among the rows, moving the dough, scooping it from the air, releasing it from their fingers over the crops. At the side of the garden was a row of beehives, Bow Wow led Johnny there. A man was pulling out trays of honeycomb and allowing the amber honey to flow down through a funnel glass, a funnel into a glass jar. He wore no hood on his head or gloves on his hands. Bees were swarming around his face and climbing up his neck and around the curve of his ears. He nuzzled the cluster of bees on the back of his hand with his bushy mustache. They like to be touched, he said. 
He looked into Johnny's face. You're Johnny Arcane. I am. The bee man dipped a finger into the honey and touched it to his tongue. There are bees where you come from, he said. There are. My mother kept bees, and once I brought down a hive of bees from the silo at the corn fest in King Corn. The bee man nodded, and then he carefully slipped the comb back into the hive and closed the jar. There were no bees outside free land, he said, until just recently. The trees stopped making fruit, and most of them died. The cornfields and the wheat fields dried up. Many of the meat animals starved. But now we hear from our scouts the pears outside our borders are blooming again. The mustard fields are yellow. Our bees have flown beyond the forest. This is how it happens. Bow Wow walked Johnny through the arbor and back into the garden. Nothing comes in from the outside, he said, except a few souls, like yours, who are guided by destiny. At the heart of Freeland is a well of living water. Our task is to prepare the soil so that water can percolate out into the world. It can't be pushed, it has to flow. This is what Mars Daniel did not understand. Johnny knelt and ran his fingers along the fuzzy leaf of a young tomato plant. He stood. Lucy told me that Freeland was founded by seers. Are you a seer? Bow Wow held up his hand with the, his fingers splayed. What do you see here, Johnny Arcane? I see your hand. Ah, so you see. You must be a seer. But I, I thought a seer was someone who could see the invisible, the past, the future, things far away, things that other people can't see. There is no distinction between the visible and the invisible. Start with anything, a hand, a leaf, a turd by the side of the road. Soon you will see everything. We are all seers here, and so are you. Abigail, we must find some work for our young sojourner, Johnny Arcane. He thinks too much. A young woman looked up from a plot of freshly sprouted greens. I'm thinning, she said. He can help me thin. So Johnny spent the morning thinning greens in the gardens of Freeland. Abigail told him that the seeds were tiny and no one had the eyesight or the patience to sow them each four fingers apart as required. Instead, they would sprinkle the seeds as they fell along the rows. And now the rows were verdant with sprouts crowding each other for space. For each sprout that remained, a dozen had to be pulled, and you had to choose carefully, determining which were most likely to grow into strong, healthy heads of vigorous, life-giving leaves. And then, of course, you had to apologize to the ones you pulled, all of them, each one, one at a time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It wasn't your destiny. She glanced at him briefly, then cast her eyes down. Sometimes, after a morning thinning, I just have to go someplace to cry. When the sun reached center sky, a bell rang from the round building, and everyone gathered at a stone pool to wash for the meal. Children splashed in the water and threw it in each other's faces. There were ladles and troughs, and some people scooped water over their heads and down the folds of their robes. 
Inside the building was a single room, like a long hall, but it was round, not long, and flooded with natural light from openings in the vaulted ceiling. At the center stood a large round stone table with cushions all about. Food on the table, piles of fruit and vegetables, rounds of cheese, loaves of bread. People helped themselves and sat on the cushions. Bow Wow beckoned Johnny from his cushion. A child sat next to him. A boy, no more than six summers, shy and clinging to Bow Wow's arm. I told you about the few souls who come here from the outside. This is Timothy. He showed up one rainy night last winter, speaking a language that none of us understood. It was a wondrous thing to discover there are languages we didn't know about. He has learned a few of our words, but we have yet to learn a single one of his. Timothy shied behind Bow Wow's orange robe, peeked out with sun-round eyes, then hid behind the robe again. Johnny empathized his discontent and a discomfort and left to find something to eat. There were no plates at the table, and many of the fruits and vegetables were unknown to him. He tried this, he tried that. All the while, the child, Timothy, eyed him with caution and curiosity. After the meal was finished and cleared, some, mostly children, gathered in the open space while others went out to resume their chores. Watch closely, Johnny, said Bow Wow. This is when the young people learn the movements, what, what Lucy called moving the dough. It may serve you to know this. The teacher was a woman with long white hair. Her words were not direct. She simply stood before the loosely gathered collection of children and announced, Form one! Then she began to move. She spoke of each movement in fanciful terms. Leaning over and scooping from the floor, she said, Here we gather the gifts of the morning dew, and here we roll them into the warm ball of the sun, as her hands curved around a sphere of invisible substance. Here we knead the dough and shape the loaf, her fingers extending and contracting with each thrust and release, her hands scooping high above her head and down to the cauldron of her belly, she intoned, Here we harvest the stars to give them to the earth. With sweeping arcs up and away from her body, here we fling the flowers of the morning over the tops of the trees. The smaller children, earnest and clumsy, stumbled through the movements with awkward sincerity. The older ones performed with grace and confidence and a bit of pride, especially the girls who scoffed at the missteps of the boys, and the youth plodded along grudgingly, listless and distracted, their minds on other things, the boys stealing glances at the girls, the girls at the boys. Form one, again. The second time Johnny joined in, the movements were simple. They flowed naturally, and it wasn't long before he began to feel the substance in his hands, its weight when he lifted it, its shape changing when he rolled and stretched and molded it, the sudden lightness in his fingers when he hurled it into the air. It balanced him through the swoons and pivots of the form. It lent him grace. There were three forms, each completed twice. The second had to do with the effect of the substances on the body of the mover. Feel it radiating from your palms to your face. Draw one handful from the cold well, the other from the warm. Feel the difference. Gather as much as you can in your arms at one time and feel it escape through your fingers. The third form was interactive. They play catch with the substance. They pull it into ribbons like taffy in pairs, two people stretching and compacting a single ball. Abigail, from the garden, approached Johnny with her arms cradled around something invisible. 
They worked it between their fingers. When she pulled, he could feel his body shifting toward her. He pulled back, and she leaned his way. This made her giggle, and the substance immediately became weightless. They had to gather some more to continue. In the long shadows of evening, Johnny found Bow Wow strolling through the rose garden on the hillside behind the roundhouse. Young Timothy was walking beside him. The roses were sorted by color into beds, and each variety had a metal placard with its name. Bow Wow was reading the names of the roses to the child, and the child was repeating them. The shy maiden's blush, the plowman's pride, welcome home, meet me on the bridge, the lover's knot, safe at anchor, summer wine, a friend for life. They sounded like the names of fiddle tunes. And if there weren't fiddle tunes with those names, surely he could make some up. And how was your day in Freeland, young sojourner? Johnny sighed. I don't know if I can help it. I feel like I belong here. You are here, Johnny Arcane, but there is still work for you to do. It is the nature of this work that does not allow you to stay. Johnny scanned the roses and the placards until his eyes focused on one bitter cup. A man came to the bathhouse when I was there. He bothered Lucy. She said, you sent him away by erasing his memory. Mars said, that's how you keep Freelance safe. You can erase the memory of anyone who attacks and they forget why they came. I know what you're thinking, Bow Wow replied. Our power is great, greater than the powers of chaos and cruelty, and we are destined to triumph. But it isn't that simple. If there is a battle, we will always lose. Battle is the crowning triumph of chaos and cruelty. Our victory is in the slow outward growth of the forest, the flight of the bees, and the way we send out the dough to catch the wind and sail it into the world. The bell at the roundhouse began to ring. Young Timothy perked up his ears. He turned at Bow Wow's robe and said something in another language. You go ahead, said Bow Wow. We'll catch up. The boy did a quick dance and scampered off. As he ran, he chirped a little bird song made of trills and syllables. Johnny felt a startle of recognition. It was Lucy's language, clear and bright as the bell tones of the rain ladles. Lucy! Was it possible Bow Wow did not know? We're going to sing the sun down now, said Bow Wow. Will you join us? That night, he sat at the table in his room, eating the meal that had been left at the door. The amber bottle was empty. Tonight, he drank cold water. His clothes were clean and neatly folded at the foot of the bed. He had no wish to put them on. The orange robe was so comfortable on his skin. His heart was, was troubled. His memory would only skip lightly over the events of recent days. He had broken the glass door in Ladyland. He had watched a body fall from the upper levels of Solomon's Tower. He had killed a man, and Mars was dead and Trespasser had brought him safely to Freeland, where he belonged, where he felt 
in every pore of his skin, in every breath, through his lungs, in every melody in his ears, and in the feel of the dough between his fingers. He belonged in Freeland, but he must leave. Battles are only won by the power of chaos and cruelty. He still had work to do, but the nature of his work was not disclosed. Why were there so many mysteries? But of course there are always mysteries. Most people ignore them. His mother would simply sprinkle a pinch of fire grade ash into the wall sconces and the mysteries would leave her alone. It was his fate as a sojourner to be troubled by the mysteries. Driven to wandering the roads alone, he had made a map of the known world and finally crossed over into the unknown world. But the mysteries only compounded mystery upon mystery. These thoughts did him no good. He got up and paced the room. Where was Lucy? She wasn't here tonight as she had been last night, conjured by the elixir and the bath's warm waters. But the boy, Timothy, had spoken her language. What did that mean? What did anything mean? Too restless to sleep, he left the room and entered the hall. It was pitch dark. He had to feel his way out through the labyrinth and into the open air. Must be very late. There were no lights anywhere, but the stars shimmered over the meadow, and the waning moon was rising above the trees. Suddenly, he saw sparks, quick little dances of light that flashed and faded here and there in the clearing. Fireflies! He recognized them at once. How many summer nights as a child had he sat on the porch with mother, watching the fireflies sparkle over the garden. He entered the meadow. The sprightly spirits leapt and cavorted around him. He stopped at the center and stood stone still. Something was gradually dawning on him. They weren't fireflies. There were people in the meadow, orange-robed, slowly moving the dough, and at certain pivots in the form, the substances caught a glint of some hidden light and reflected it back briefly like the flash of a firefly. Stunned, he sat on the ground slowly and quieted and quietly as possible, not to be seen for a long time. He sat there, watching the graceful shadowed movements, watching the bursts of illumination as they traced the form, marveling at the occasional rebellious spirits of light that escaped from their confines and streaked up above the treetops into the starlit sky. Early morning, a quiet rap on the door awakened him. Bow Wow stood there with two others. One of them was the white-haired leader of the movement class. The other was a thin, elderly man with a gentle face. Johnny, we have found Lucy. Johnny's heart jumped. Is she alive? She is moving toward Freeland. We have not seen her. We have just detected her movements. Today we will send out protectors to surround her and assure she arrives safely. She will not be aware of them. Johnny sat on the bed. His mind was dancing. Then I'll see her again. Bow Wow laid a hand on his shoulder. I'm afraid that is not so, Johnny Arcane. It is too dangerous. They do not know you are here now. If they find out, they will attack. People will be killed. Maybe even Lucy. Johnny couldn't believe what he was hearing, but where will I go? That has been arranged. We will erase your memory, then give you instructions. When your memory returns, you will be far from here on a long journey that will bring you home. 
He held up his hand to the woman behind him. Beatrice. The white-haired woman came forward, holding something. This was made for you, Johnny Arcane, she said. Sandyman worked on it all night. This morning we stocked it with provisions. She held out a leather bag with straps filled with parcels, packets, cloth sacks, with drawstrings, boxes wrapped in parchment, bottles and jars, and at the bottom something that looked like a book. The leather of the pack was burnished to a reddish hue and tooled with slaps and pockets, and a webbed holster had been sewn in one side for the mandolin in its new cloth case. I'm sorry, said Bow Wow. Today we must be like the wind and not the tree. We have provided everything you need. You will not know where, who you are, but you will know how to survive and where to go. You will be given a guide. You may not recognize the guide at first. Come. We will demonstrate how we protect ourselves at Freeland. It happened so quickly. Johnny didn't have time to speculate what it would be like. The two others entered the room. The woman sat at his right side on the bed, Bow Wow at his left. The other man pulled up the chair and faced them. Bow Wow reached out and they formed a circle of hands. Suddenly, Johnny remembered what he was wearing. But the robe. Don't worry, said Bow Wow. We will take the robe. Then they closed their eyes.